Howdy, it's Tubal Kane again on a beautiful sunny morning here in uh, Illinois and a spring is coming so it's it's a little bit better outside now and you know I'm standing before my uh, Bridgeport mill and I'm sick and tired of after 40 years of cranking this thing up and down I'm getting too old so I'm gonna make the power adapter for the crank and the knee here to do that now I invented that over 40 years ago but of course over a hundred thousand other men invented it as well and I never did anything about it and of course there's many people now that make a commercially uh, uh, machined uh, adapter for this and I'm a little too late on that but here's how to make one yourself I doubt if you'll want to do it it's a lot more work than it's worth and I think you can buy one for about fifty dollars to so do that but you might find this interesting to see how I make this this is what that little beauty looks like. There's two pieces here. This is all one piece here, but uh, the shank here is a uh, hex stock that's been installed and pinned into place, but the rest is all one piece. And I'll take you through this step by step, but it simply fits on like this. And you use your electric drill or your battery power drill and up and down you go zip, zip, zip as much as you want and as fast as you want. Let me plug it under the drill here and show you how it works. If I may digress, over the years I've owned many battery powered uh, drills and none of them are worth a darn, especially these two that I've got here. And I've had all the major brands, but you know they hold a charge just long enough for you to get up on top of the ladder with an eighth inch drill bit to hang a picture in a drywall before they go dead but uh, this one is freshly charged so it should last for up to uh, 30 seconds of course it's easier going down I must apologize it worked a little better than what I expected but if you really want some power, of course you got to use a, a, a plug-in type, and uh, but then you're tied to that cord, and that's no fun either. So if you got a good uh, battery power drill, that's that's the route to go. As you know, I never work from blueprints, but I uh, sometimes make notes and little sketches and so on. But uh, I also did a rehearsal or a practice piece here, and I made it out of aluminum. Of course, you want to make yours out of steel. Not your practice piece, but uh, your final one needs to be made out of steel. But in fact, uh, if you got some uh, plastic or aluminum or wax, machinable wax, go ahead and uh, do one out of uh, that material first, uh, because there's a lot to go wrong with this, and I uh, I did uh, make several uh, to get the final dimensions, and it simply fits on like that. Now this is 5 8 diameter shaft here and measure the length on yours and I think all the genuine bridge ports and clones are probably about the same but I don't know that for sure and then of course to aggravate things the cogs on here are uh, a numbers uh, 9 not an even number but an odd number of 9 and that makes it just a little bit more difficult but uh, take all your dimensions off of this and, and this uh, or double check them and compare them with the dimensions that I give you. But of course you're making it to fit this not the crank. Let's go to the bench and uh, talk seriously about this. Now the crank measures one and five eighths right there. They couldn't make it easy you know but where are you going to get one and five eighths stock? It's not very standard, but I did have a piece I lucked out. But you can also start with uh, one and three quarter, which is what this was, and, and uh, step it down or turn the whole piece down or whatever you want to do. It isn't that critical, but you do want it one and five eighths right near the end. And uh, here's my stock already cut and faced, and again it is one and five eighths diameter, and it's uh, two and three quarter long, and that can of course vary just a little bit. Now when you look into the hole here, we've got a uh, 5 8 hole here that goes in, well I'll give you that dimension in just a second, and then it's a 1 inch hole here, just bored a quarter inch deep. That's just clearance. 
Then we've got nine cogs and nine spaces for a total of 18. Talk about that in just a second. Let's talk about the shank here first. I made my shank out of a half inch hex and I just happened to have about a six inch piece of that enough to make two of them. But that's not something you're going to find out at the store either. But you can certainly make yours out of a round stock and then uh, use a, a Jacob's chuck to hold it. But you know it's going to slip like crazy. And by the way I use a, a half inch socket here with the adapter to go into the drill. And it would be better to have a 3 8 adapter here but quarter inch is what I had. And this is a, a 6 point socket. Don't use a 12 point. They shouldn't even manufacture 12 points. I loathe them. I absolutely loathe them. A six-pointer is what it's all about and that'll fit right on like that and you can make this length whatever you want and in this case here I have about an inch and an eighth sticking out. Now one other possibility is for you to get one of these coupler nuts from uh, the hardware store and they sell that where they sell threaded rod and it's possible that you could um, drill this out or, or thread it, put a piece of threaded rod in there or a bolt and pin it to that and then you got your your hexagon. So that's another route you can go. I'm just trying to give you different possibilities for that. But that's how I made it. So in review, this is 1 and 5 eighths. This has been turned down to 1 inch diameter and that could be any diameter or you don't even have to turn it down at all. I just like the looks of it better or you could have a little radius there or you could taper this off or whatever your little heart desires or whatever your uh, your uh, uh, mind can conjure up and that's pinned with an eighth inch roll pin and I turn down the end of this to uh, 7 16 so there's a 7 16 hole board drilled clear through to start with then the 5 8 and then the 1 inch and I'll take you through that on the lathe here momentarily. Now as far as these lengths are concerned again it's uh, two and three quarter overall and this portion here is uh, approximately one and five eighths. The shank here, this portion here, oh not quite an inch. It could have been an inch. It just came out that way. Not critical at all. So those are your dimensions. Now let's talk a little bit about the geometry right here. Alright, here it is from the end view and I painted the uh, the male cogs uh, red for your viewing pleasure. And uh, we got nine uh, male cogs and nine uh, female cogs or spaces if I'm using the terminology correctly but if not I'm making up my own terminology. But with nine cogs and nine spaces, we got a total of, uh, of 18 uh, cogs. And there's 360 degrees in a circle. So if you divide the 360 by 18, we're coming up with 20 degrees for each cog. How about that? Now what I did is I made up a little uh, a gauge, a 20 degree gauge. Not that you need to or not that it's necessary, but just for the the pleasure of it. I made that and you can see that it fits and you can even uh, mark it and I did with a little red line there for a depth and use it as a gauge. And so on right away right all right all the way around <clears throat> 20 degrees. Now you're gonna need a dividing head or a rotary table. I'm using a rotary table to do this and it's easier with a rotary or a table of uh, a dividing head uh, puts the work up too high and of course you have to convert uh, your uh, your spaces into degrees if you're using a dividing head but a rotary table works with uh, using the degrees so I think you're better off with a rotary table. If you have both that is and most of you probably do not have that luxury. To make things even more difficult not only are the cogs uh, 20 degrees apart but of course the uh, shape of each cog and each space is, uh, is tapered, tapered at 20 degrees. So we have uh, all kinds of uh, uh, angles that we have to uh, consider and uh, deliberate about and, uh, 
and accommodate as we machine this and I'll show you most of that as we get over to the uh, Bridgeport Mill and start on the project. But before I do any of that I'm going to go ahead and uh, do the initial machining on that which means I'm going to do all of the holes. I think I'll wait until later to turn this step right here. Not only think I will wait till later but I'm going to do the holes and the drilling and the boring right now. Howdy there down under. Another consideration for you if you don't have any hex stock is to take uh, Allen wrenches and you probably got a whole box of them if you're anything like me. Well this is a half inch uh, hex key and uh, it could be a 3 8 or 7 16 or whatever you feel like. But anyway you could uh, now, anneal this. Of course you can't machine this uh, the way it presently is, so you would need to anneal it, that is soften it if you know how to do that, simply to heat it up uh, red hot to the critical temperature and uh, very slowly, slowly cool it down and that anneals it or softens it, but that's another source of hexagon stock. The stock is in the three jaw chuck of the closing lathe and uh, the center drill it with this great big center drill just to get it started. And now a quarter inch pilot drill all the way through. Clear your chips from time to time, otherwise they just can't get out of there and you can break the bit off. And now 7 sixteenths all the way through because I'm going to turn down one end of this to 7 sixteenths. That's my reason for that, but you may need a, a different dimension. Slow your spindle down as needed, depending on the size of the bit. Small bits, fast speeds, large bits, slow speeds. And I like to feed uh, and then do well. It breaks the chips so you don't have those miserable long chips to deal with. Next is a 5 8 drill. Now you don't need to ream that. This is just a clearance size for the, the shank as you remember over there on the milling machine. And that's to a depth of uh, one and a half inch. I marked my drill bit, but of course you can use the graduated uh, uh, part of the uh, of the quill here. But I I just prefer to uh, mark the drill bit. Slow speeds for a large drill. And I'm right up to my mark. Next, I'm boring this one inch hole right here. It's only quarter inch deep, and I'm using a boring bar. As such, and I've set my depth stop, my carriage depth already, so I'll go in one quarter of an inch. I'm going to use a caliper for that. Now, if you're in the mood, you could just use a one inch bit and go in a little bit, but this doesn't give you a flat bottom hole. I desire a flat bottom hole, so that's the way I'm going to do it. Watch the carriage stop here as I bore.
the lathe work is done, at least for now. I also took this countersink while I had it uh, in the lathe and put a little bit of a countersink right here. And now it's ready to go to the mill to form the cogs. I'll be using two different cutters on this job. The 3 sixteenths will be run at 1 or 11 15 RPM and the 8th inch 17 50. Now the 8th inch is extremely fragile so don't even start the job unless you've got a whole drawer of them. But I'll use the 3 sixteenths just to make the initial straight cuts and then come back with the 8th inch to do the angles on the sides. So I'll be taking a total of three different passes around the work. We're ready to get down to the business at hand, but let me talk just a little bit about the rotary table to start with. And I've got the rotary table already mounted on the uh, milling machine table. And the first thing that you need to do with any rotary table before you begin a job is to center the spindle of the milling machine, that is the quill, the very center of the spindle must be centered with the center of the table. Now I have already done that and I did that uh, with a coaxial indicator or you can use a regular indicator and there's other ways of doing it, shortcut ways that would be close enough also. But take a look at my tips number 188 where I show how to use a coaxial indicator and it could be used with a uh, boring or any other process that you're doing but uh, I, you can use the coaxial to center your uh, rotary table. Now once you've done that zero out your DRO and leave the power on and leave that zeroed out until you're done with the job. Now we're still not done. You need to mount a three jaw chuck on your rotary table and I've done this some time ago where I, I made a aluminum plate here and uh, there's screws that are uh, th there's threaded holes with screws holding the rotary table onto this plate and then in turn the aluminum plate is bolted onto the uh, rotary table in these little T-slots with T-nuts. That being done you must also center the chuck with the quill. And that can be done in a similar manner to, uh, to what I just mentioned, but it, it, it has to be centered. Both the rotary table and the chuck are all is for naught. And once that is done, then we are finally ready to mount the work. And I'll tighten it down real well with my uh, chuck key. Get it good and tight, that's interfering with the... I'll tighten that a little bit better off, off camera. Now notice that I've got the zero and the witness mark lined up. And uh, that's important because that's going to be our starting point. Make sure that you faced the end of the work because uh, that faced end is flush up against the face of the chuck and that determines that the work is perpendicular. Now it's got to be perpendicular. There's just a lot of little things you got to watch here. And I've tightened it up a little bit uh, tighter than what I just showed you. Now another thing I want to show you on this particular rotary table and depending on what brand you got they're certainly going to vary. But right here and here there are locking uh, screws and little clamps. This one is snugged up just a little bit. This is the one that I will loosen and tighten each time I take a cut so that there isn't any possibility of this moving because there's always just a little bit of a lost motion, backlash and whatnot and, and all of these because there is a worm and a worm wheel in here and that's the principle upon which this works. Now you can also, in addition to cranking this, Maybe I'm confusing the point here now, but we can 
Yep. Now I have disengaged the worm. That's doing nothing. It's spinning free. If, for the sake of expediency, you want to do this a little faster without using the crank, we can put this on zero, our starting point. I'm looking down here. They're right on zero. And then lock it each time instead of using the crank. I'm going to use the crank. I'm just telling you that there's more than one way of doing it. I will re-engage the worm. I have the rotary table set on zero and locked. Notice I put a mark here, an arrowhead. That's my starting point. That's optional, of course. Now these cogs are 150 thousandths deep. So the first thing I will do is, and I'm going to move, I'm going to do all of my feeding with the the Y axis, but I'm going to loosen the quill and bring this down so I am touching the work ever so lightly. Lock the quill, back it off, and I'm going to raise the knee 150 thousandths, and that is the depth of my uh, cogs. I'll do that off camera. Now let's see if I can explain how we're going to index this each time. Remember that uh, there are nine cogs, actually a total of 18, because there's a male and female. So, since it's 20 degrees for each one, but actually, by the time you get to the second one here, you've moved 40 degrees. So, I'm going to mill one. Make yourself a little table like this. So, there's nine slots or cogs, and they're 40 degrees apart, even though I said 20. I don't know if I made that clear, and they're 150 thousandths deep. So, the first one we will mill with the 3 sixteenths cutter at zero degrees. Then, 40 degrees. I will advance the uh, rotor table then to 80, 120, 160, 200, 240, 280, and 320. Now, do not uh, commit this to memory. Have a little chart alongside here so you don't goof it up because you become very discouraged if you have to start over. So you only need to do it once if you concentrate on what you're doing. So make this chart and we'll start it at zero degrees. And I'm going to have this laying right here and I use the chart myself. There it is.